as the scorching sun set in the horizon, ten brothers entered the court of the royal official. Wiping sweat and dust off their faces, they trembled with fear as they approached the throne room. They somberly and quietly got closer to the throne. Filled with immense guilt, with tears streaming down their eyes. They knew what they had done. It was written all over their long faces. The one whom they had so grievously offended was the very person sitting in the throne right in front of them, their younger brother, Joseph. Two decades earlier, these very same brothers didn't show him any mercy. They relished his cries for help when they left them in that empty cistern. They were overjoyed when they saw his tear-filled face look back as he was being led off to a foreign and distant land. Now, here they were, begging him for mercy. What would he do? What would you do when every fiber of your being cries out for vengeance and for justice? Would you be able to forgive those who wronged you so badly? As you think about that, consider this. What did God do for us who wronged him so badly? He showed us a forgiveness like no other, despite having no reason to give it to us. And in doing so, he gave us every reason to forgive others. What do we see when we look at the unmerciful servant? A man who somehow accumulated a massive and unpayable debt, a debt of nearly $20 million by today's estimates. How incompetent was he to even acquire such an astronomical debt? What do we see when we look at the unmerciful servant? A cruel and heartless individual. A man who so quickly forgot the mercy shown him. A man who terrorized his fellow servant all over a much smaller and insignificant debt. What do we see when we look at the unmerciful servant? A man who got exactly what he deserved. A man whose punishment was well earned for his egregious lack of mercy. This unmerciful servant is truly a loathsome and deplorable individual, quite possibly one of the most unlikable characters in all of Jesus' parables. And there's a reason for that. We're not supposed to like this guy. When Jesus told this parable to Peter, he wanted Peter to be unsettled at this man's lack of mercy. Likewise, he wants us to also be just as unsettled about this man's lack of mercy. But there's even more to it than that. Peter, what else do you see when you look at the unmerciful servant? My fellow believers at Gethsemane, what else do we see when we look at the unmerciful servant? Does it look familiar? Does it look like ourselves? Yes, Jesus wants us to see ourselves in this unmerciful servant. No. No, that's, that's impossible. We're not like him. He had no reason for his lack of mercy. But when I don't forgive, I have all the reasons in the world. Yeah, I hold a grudge against that person. You know what he did to me? He humiliated me. Everyone around agrees that I'm right. Sure. I wanted her to fail. What gives? 
I just wanted her to experience the same pain, the same agony that I experienced because of her. It's called justice. Do you know how badly I was hurt? I'm the victim. He's the offender. I have every right to despise him. Or maybe we think along the, along the lines of Peter. I'm really forgiving. But you got to have limits. You don't want anyone taking advantage of you, do you? Peter suggested forgiving the same brother up to seven times. How long does it take before we start to lose our patience? Maybe we adhere much more to a free strikes you're out mentality. Sure, I can tolerate the first couple of mishaps, but if you do that again, that's it. Unforgivable. You cross the line. Whether it's holding a grudge against an offender, wishing evil upon our offender, victim mentality, or putting limits on our forgiveness, we put our own feelings of offense, our own emotions, our own hurt emotions on a pedestal. We idolize ourselves and how offended we were while minimizing how heinous our acts were before God. We scoff at the unmerciful servant's lack of forgiveness, but we make excuses for our own. Scripture tells us in Job chapter 34, his eyes are on the ways of men. He sees their every step. There is no dark place, no deep shadows where evildoers can hide. Nothing is hidden before God. The master in the parable had other servants who reported back to him what the unmerciful servant did, but God doesn't need that. God sees everything. Our lack of mercy, our lack of forgiveness, and our already massive debt of sins cries out to heaven. And what does God say about such lack of mercy? James tells us in his epistle, in chapter 2, that judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who is unmerciful. Our lack of mercy merits us exactly what the unmerciful servant received at the end of the parable. Judgment. And this judgment is far worse than just a debtor's prison. Our lack of mercy merits us eternal damnation in the same place that God reserved for the devil and his angels. Hell. Here we stand before God completely unable to make up for our massive debt of sins, and often unmerciful and unforgiving alongside it. What were we to say to God? How could we defend ourselves? Much like the ten brothers in our Old Testament reading, all we can do is fall on our knees and beg God for mercy. All we can do is join David in his confession in Psalm 51, verse 4, against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. We give God no reason to forgive us. But through Jesus, he gives us a forgiveness like no other. A man clothed in a tunic of camel's hair cried out to those standing by the Jordan River, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This man was none other than John the Baptist. His role, to prepare the way for the Lord's anointed. Not long afterwards, the one to whom John was pointing, the man he himself described as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, said that very same message to those around him. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This kingdom of heaven is not an earthly or physical kingdom, but rather it is God's gracious rule in the hearts of all believers. 
As Jesus introduced this parable, he made reference to this kingdom of heaven. But that was meant to perk up both our ears and Peter's ears in the kingdom of heaven. Things are different from how they are in the world. In the kingdom of heaven, the forgiveness of sins is of primary importance. How important was the forgiveness of sins? It was so important that throughout Jesus' ministry on earth, he both proclaimed and administered the forgiveness of sins. In Matthew chapter 9, when a paralytic was brought before Jesus, he told him this before healing him. Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Forgiving this man's sins was even more important than healing his paralysis. Or think of the woman in Luke chapter 7 who anointed Jesus at a Pharisee's house. Rather than judging her like the Pharisee did, Jesus understood that what she was doing was an act of gratitude for his forgiveness. And so he reassured her and confirmed to her that her sins were indeed forgiven. Or in John chapter 8, Jesus prevented a mob from stoning a woman to death when they found out she committed adultery. Rather than denouncing her, Jesus simply told her, I don't condemn you. Now go, leave your life of sin. Jesus even forgave those who were killing him. As he was being nailed to the cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. How important was the forgiveness of sins? It was so important that Christ suffered the punishment necessary for us to receive it. What did the master in the parable lose for canceling his servant's debt? Maybe a significant financial loss, but it's safe to assume he had plenty of money to spare. What did God the Father lose for canceling our massive debt of sins? He lost his very own son. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, true God, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, gave up his life so that we could be forgiven. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, we were bought at a price. And as Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 53, verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. Our massive debt of sins, our lack of mercy, and our lack of forgiveness were not inconsequential. They put the Son of God to death. How important was the forgiveness of sins? It was so important that after Jesus triumphantly rose from the dead, he gave his now fully forgiven church. He gave us the privilege of forgiving people their sins. As he tells us in John 20, verse 23, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. And alongside that, he also gave his church another wonderful privilege. That is the privilege of preaching this forgiveness of sins, of preaching this gospel to all those around us. As he tells us in Luke chapter 24, this is what is written. The Son of Man will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Despite having no reason to forgive us, God has given us every reason to forgive those who sin against us. As Paul tells us in Colossians 3, verse 13, bear with one another and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. As God forgives us unconditionally, so also we forgive our offenders unconditionally. Why? It's simply what redeemed children of God love to do. Our old, sinful, and unmerciful old Adam inside all of us is dead. And a new, holy, and merciful child of God 
was raised to life when we were baptized. That is who we really are. And so, we get to imitate our loving Father in heaven, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. As children of God, when we forgive people their sins, Christ himself also forgives them their sins. When we forgive those who sin against us, they receive the same peace of mind that we received when we were forgiven. When we forgive those who sin against us, we show them the same unconditional love that God shows us all the time when he forgives us. When we forgive those who sin against us, they receive the same relief that we received, that their sins no longer condemn them. And we get to reassure them with what David assures us in Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The ten brothers waited anxiously for Joseph to answer. They knew they deserved to be punished. They couldn't blame Joseph if he wanted retribution. They even expected it. But Joseph, with tears clouding his eyes, told them this. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? His brothers were stunned. Joseph forgave them. Much like the brothers, all we can do is be awestruck at the amazing love and unfathomable mercy of Christ. Not only does he forgive us, but he gave up his life so that he could forgive us. And not only that, but he continues to forgive us, even though we daily sin. Now we have the joy of sharing this gospel with those around us. Now we have the joy of assuring people that their sins truly are forgiven. Now we have the joy of saying these words to our offenders when they repent and ask us for forgiveness. My dear brother in Christ, my dear sister in Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen.